Every year about this time, uh, I am reminded uh, at the end of January about uh, the Roe v. Wade decision that went down now 38 years ago. And uh, uh, to some of us, uh, it, it's, it's just a heartbreaking thing. So I, I want I to keep some visibility up for you about what's going on in our country in terms of abortion uh, and take a moment to mourn together, too. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, you just don't see it in the papers anymore. It's become such a routine part of our culture and, and, um, and our alternative to pregnancy. Uh, there was a study that was just done, I, I think it was this last year, end of last year, where they studied pregnancies in New York City uh, and by race. Found out that for, uh, for Caucasians, for whites, uh, 20% of all pregnancies end in abortion, 20%. For Hispanics, it's 40%. And for the black community, for the African Americans, it's 60%. Wow, why didn't someone tell me about this? It just doesn't make the news. It was a very, very famous report that was done in the last year. Um, the rate of abortions in the country has sort of leveled off over the last couple of years. Uh, about in the, I think it was the mid 80s, it peaked at, in our country at about 1.6 million in this country. It's now leveled off at 1.2 million per year. Uh, so if anyone says to you, well, abortions are on the decline, they're not. They're almost the same number every year now, 1.2 million. And to give you an idea what 1.2 million is, that's the present population of San Diego. So every year, we're losing as many people as the entire population of San Diego. Or, or if you want, uh, Dallas is 1.2 million. Uh, San Antonio is 1.2 million. So in a sense, you could say that, that this coming year in 2011, uh, enough, enough people will not be born that could have populated all of San Diego. In 2012, enough to populate all of Dallas. In 2013, enough people to populate San Antonio. And on and on and on it goes. Uh, we need to mourn as a country, as a people. Um, there, there, is, there is so few alternative voices to women that are in need about what to do that are alternatives. One of them is right here in town, the Pregnancy Care Center, which is just right across the parking lot here on 1st, is a place where women who are in crisis with pregnancies who didn't expect them and now don't know what to do uh, in a serious emotional crisis, say, what, what can I do? What are my options? And so um, through peer counseling, we, we tell them what those options are. But we need to continue to be a voice for life because one of the things that the Lord tells us, it's very prominent through the Old Testament, is that um, in a way he's going to judge the nations based on two criteria, how they deal with widows and how they deal with orphans. The two classic powerless groups in culture. And that's exactly what this whole issue is about, in a sense. Women and children who have no power. So, um, so I just want to lead us in prayer right now, uh, mourn for a moment quietly, and ask that God will continue to use us as a light in a, in a very dark place, a very dark place. Millions of people are dying, and you won't find it on the newspapers anymore. So let's pray just for a moment. <clears throat> Lord, I, I, uh, my heart just grieves for those who are not with us now. Since 73, 52 million, 52 million people are not amongst us who would be adults. Lord, we pray that you would make us informed and, and clear voices of hope in a, a landscape that is so dark. Lord, forgive us for incorporating into the fabric of our society uh, killing as a result of solving social problems. Lord, make us agents of grace. Lord, we know that, that many of these women find themselves in what seems like impossible situations. Just impossible situations. And under pressures from, from boyfriends and from family and swirling pressures for career. I mean, there's so many factors. And, and there, there's that heart of tremendous need. 
Now what do I do? Lord, make us voices of graciousness and proponents for life. Lord, use us to stop this, we pray in in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just wanted to remind you, uh, I mourn every week during this part of the year. And uh, yeah, 52 million abortions since 73. 52 million. You can basically cut out all the states in the center of this country, and that's 52 million. Just leave the coastal states. All the rest of them are unpopulated. So continue to pray. Um, There's a tremendous need for compassion and for voices for life. But our culture accepts it now as just, oh, it's routine. It should never be routine. Killing should never be. Well, on that bright note, <laughs> morning is good uh, many times. We are, uh, we're taking a look at 2 Corinthians. We're studying through it. And uh, as I said before, it's, it's something of a, a, a compassionate look at Paul's heart in contrast to 1 Corinthians, which is really a, it's a, it's a great letter about doctrine and content and thinking straight and stuff like that. The Second Corinthians will have its own share of thinking straight stuff as well. But we'll also get a chance to see Paul's heart. And today we'll see a beginning of that, to see Paul's heart in his relationship with this church in, in, in Corinth. Uh, so that's what we're going to continue on today. We're in the middle of chapter one. So we just got started. But here's how, how I want to preface it. You've probably seen movies or seen a stage play where a telephone rings, ring, ring, and they pick up the phone and the conversation goes something like this. Hello? Well, what do you mean? Just now? Well, what does pink have to do with it? I, I, I don't know. How many, what, what? Oh, well, okay. Okay, fine. Now you're listening to this conversation, and you're saying to yourself, what? <laughs> you feel like you didn't hear most of the conversation, right? That's why good stage play writers will write it in a different kind of way so that what the person says tells you what the other person's saying on the other end. Hello? Oh, hi. You're at this store right now, and you're buying something pink? Oh, and it's got hummingbirds on it? Wonderful. Okay, you see what I'm saying? That's what they did. Well, when you read through 2 Corinthians, like we did two weeks ago, a portion of 2 Corinthians sounds like we're not here on the other side of the conversation, and that's the section today. You read through it, and you say, what? What? Right? And I told you when we'd read through it, you'd, you'd listen to it and go, oh, wait a second, I don't get what that. Well, that's because you're not hearing half the conversation. So today, uh, in some, uh, uh, some, I'll call it divine speculation, I'm going to tell you what the other side of the conversation is, because when you see that, then what Paul writes in response makes sense. Okay, you with me? I'm not going to die for these proposals I'm going to make, but uh, let's just see how it goes. We're in 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> which is cleverly, for your ease of finding it, placed exactly after... (laughs) Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? Okay, so here we are. Here's the believers in Corinth. I'm going to show them kind of uh, symbolically like this. They're They're in turmoil right now because Paul was in Corinth for a while. He was there for 18 months, some a couple years prior to this letter being written. And now people have come in alongside the people in Corinth and have started, well, bad mouthing Paul. And so here they are, bad mouthing. And they're saying tremendously bad things. And what Paul's going to respond to is in response to what they're saying about him. So here's some of the things they might be saying. Uh, One of them was, you should see what Paul does when he's not with you. That is, when he was with you, he's on his best behavior. But when he leaves you, oh, you should see what he does. His conduct, oh, it stinks. It's horrible. He's just, he's a reprobate. Or the other one might, the other guy might say, well, listen, you know what? He's not really telling you the whole truth. He's just keeping you in the dark. He tells you just a few tidbits, you know, but he's not telling you the real story. He's not telling you what's really going on. He's just giving you a little bit. He's, he's manipulating you with how he handles truth with you. Um, Or another one they might say is this, why do you think he came here? Huh? Why do you think he'd come to Corinth? He's using you for his own purposes. Like, He's getting rich, or he's trying to get famous, or whatever. But he came here not for you. He came here for himself. He's using you. Come on, wake up. Don't let him use you. Or maybe something like this. He broke his promise to visit you. You can't trust a word he says. Remember, he said he'd come visit you again. Has he done it? No. Did he promise? Yes. You can't trust a single thing he says. 
So the whole thing, that in these arguments are what we call ad hominem arguments. Ad hominem from Latin, which means to the man. They're arguments they are supposed to be attached to the man. Now, they don't in a healthier kind of way attack what Paul teaches, you know, truth versus truth and stuff like that. The cheap shot is to take down the guy and then you don't have to consider what he says, right? Have you ever been in this situation where someone, you know, you say something difficult perhaps sometimes and then someone else comes alongside to completely eradicate your influence in this situation. They won't attack what you've said. They'll attack who you are. Yes, that's an ad hominem argument. And when someone goes to ad hominem arguments, you know that they can't fight against the things you said. All they can do is fight against your reputation. So that's why as we get into 2 Corinthians here, there are some people and largely one person we find later in the book who has been causing a lot of these problems and spreading these kinds of rumors. So as Paul starts to get into the book of 2 Corinthians, this letter, he's going to hit on these like right now. He's going to defend himself And I want you to see how he defends himself. Because remember, this is his reputation under fire. It's not the content of what he said that's under fire. And those are the principal arguments right there. How do we know? Just to give you an idea, if you read through the rest of the book, he's going to follow up on these things in chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Ah, you read ahead. Yes. So if you read ahead, you see what he's doing. But he's going to hit it off right now. He's going to try and... So let's just hit them one at a time and see how Paul deals with them. So the first one, remember, was you should see what Paul does when he's not with you. So it's actually Paul's actions, his conduct, they're going to kind of slap down. You know, he's a reprobate when he's not in Corinth. So you can't trust anything he says. So how does Paul deal with that? He says this in verse 12 of chapter 1. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that, it, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Okay, I know that sounds like a sentence fragment in a way. <laughs> but what he's saying, first off, is he's making, he's making an appeal to his conscience. He says, listen, I have a totally clear conscience. And the testimony of my conscience when I was with you, I have a totally clear conscience. There's nothing that I have done that I wouldn't do again. My conscience does not condemn me. I'm clear on this entire thing. And he says that, uh, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God. So in holiness and godly sincerity, that is every action I've ever taken, I've done in total sincerity towards you. Not, not acting like uh, something that I'm not, not saying one thing and doing another. Godly sincerity. Holiness, which is set apartness. Holiness, which means I haven't acted like the rest of the world. I've been the way God has asked me to be. And then he says an interesting thing. But in the grace of God, we conducted ourselves. Now, religious speak comes up and you go, wait a second. How do you conduct yourselves in the grace of God? I know how I conduct myself being nice. Is that what it means? Or does it mean conduct myself in the grace of God? I don't know. That's just a phrase that doesn't make any sense. Anyone, does that make any sense? Okay, do it like this. Grace, replace the word grace with gift, gift of God. Okay, the grace of God, the gifts of God, what he desires to give to you that you don't merit and you can't earn, all right? So he says, what I've done is I've allowed God's intention, his sovereign intention to give good to you, his grace, govern my conduct toward you. Ah, so what he's saying is that everything I've done in your presence, I've done for your benefit so that God's gift of grace, the good things he wants to give to you, will con- come through my good conduct. That's what it's been all about. Now, the people in Corinth can say, well, wait a second, you were here 18 months. Let me go through the records of my mind and see if that's true. Well, yeah, that's true. It seems like everything you did while you were here, you did to serve us and to give to us and to bring blessing to us. Yeah. Okay. That's, I, I can deal with that. And also, he says, not just with you, conducted ourselves in the world. That's outside of Corinth and especially toward you. So he's saying what I've done out there and what I've done with you are one and the same. My conscience does not condemn me. I am who I am. I've done what I've done. There's no difference between the Paul in Corinth and the Paul in the outside world. In terms of conduct, I'm the same guy. And that's what he says. Let's go to the second argument. He says this. He's not telling you the whole truth. He's keeping you in the dark. Or in other words, maybe maybe he's telling you something, but you need to read between the lines because what he says isn't really what he means. There's more to it than that. You got to be clever. Paul's kind of tricksy that way, right? So you, you kind of condemn how he does his truth. Well, what, how does Paul respond to that? Well, Paul's truth 
he, he says in verse 13, listen, we write nothing else to you. We write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. So he's saying, I, there's, there's nothing else. What you read is what you get. That's it. That's it. Read what I've written. That's all there is. No more. And, and you know, when you look at Paul's letters, you look at his communications in the New Testament, he's, he's a pretty straight up kind of guy. He doesn't spend a lot of time flim flaming you, uh, trying to kind of manipulate you. He just puts it out there. In fact, many times he is so bold and forthright how he puts it out there, it kind of hits like a brick. And the problem is his boldness, not his kind of talking around the edges and saying things between the lines. So that's what he's saying right here. He's saying, listen, I write nothing else to you than what you read. It, you've got the whole thing. In fact, this makes me think when Paul was, Paul was on one of his missionary journeys, he was in Ephesus. And while he was in Ephesus, he was close enough uh, to the elders there in the local church that he knew this was probably going to be the last time he was going to see them. And so he meets with them. And uh, you can see it in Acts 20 right here. He's with these godly men. And he says to them, therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Why? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. He's saying, you know, I, I, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, which means you can't blame me. I'm not guilty of anything. When I was with you, I didn't withhold anything. I gave you everything, the whole purpose. Or other versions will say the whole counsel of God. I didn't leave anything out. You got the whole thing. Got the whole thing. By implication, if I had withheld a whole bunch of stuff, you know, said these things that you can handle, but not these things, but this is also truth, then the blood would be on my head for your spiritual circumstances because I withheld the truth. But I didn't. I told you everything. And that's what he's telling the Corinthian church as well. I told you everything. There, there is nothing else. What you read is what I wrote. And there's nothing else. That's what he's talking about. He goes on to this argument right here. Well, why did you think he came here? Huh? Come on. He's using you for his own purposes. Or in other words, we're kind of throwing disrespect on Paul's motives. Why do you think he really came here? You know, the guy lives way over there on the other end of the Mediterranean. Why do you think he's here in Corinth, huh? Maybe he's using you. Why would he do this? Maybe, I know, maybe he's getting rich off of all the offerings from the different churches he's starting. Yeah, that's it. He's going to start all these churches and tell them, listen, you need to give me a whole bunch of cash all the time because I started your church. He's just doing this to get rich. He's like a first century version of a televangelist. And Paul actually will get this criticism. He'll, he'll have to talk about this. He'll have to talk about it. And, and he defends himself. He says, oh, wait, wait a second. So, so how do you counter this when someone, someone brings up um, criticisms about your motives? <laughs> Which, by the way, um, if you can't criticize the content of what someone says, and you can't criticize their conduct, then the best thing to do is criticize their motives. Because you can create the most nasty, unsubstantiated motives in the world. By the way, it's probably one of the chief avenues Satan uses to divide us. I'll say that again. It's one of the chief avenues Satan uses to divide us. Why? Well, we watch each other. We watch each other's conduct. Well, you know, because we were friends, we watch each other's conduct. But then sometimes someone's conduct does a little, bing, just a little different. You know, and it's usually something that's directed toward you or not toward you. And you listen to what they say and something inside you goes bink. And all of a sudden, same conduct, same words. A little voice comes from somewhere and I'm telling you it's coming from Satan. A little voice comes from you somewhere and says, you know what they're really thinking? You know, what they're, you know I bet you their motive is this. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever done it? Yeah, so you got to be careful. It's Satan's easiest way to separate us by trying to attribute motives that are totally fictional on top of conduct and words that have been the same as they've always been. Always been. I've been, I've been amazed in my life to see this actively work in people when I'm, I'm, I'm one way this day, I'm the same way the next day, I'm the same way months later with them, I'm exactly the same person. But over here, I was wonderful. Over here, I'm uh, a bad guy. You say, well, what's going on? Well, because you're doing this because... Uh, no, I'm not. I'm doing it for the same reasons I've always done it. What are you talking about? Satan loves to divide us that way. Loves to. By the way, a second way he does it, he attributes motives to what you see. 
You get that stuck in your head, and you, and you start working on that as a working theory. Okay, I'm not going to approach that person about that. I'm just going to use it as a working theory. And then what you start doing is you start looking for evidence to support your satanic working theory. And you'll see things differently from that person. I know. Okay, we're getting a little close to home. Just be aware that this is what goes on. What we need to do with each other, like Paul's going to say in a second, is just deal with our conduct straight up, our words straight up, and get out of the whole game of trying to divine motives, because you'll always get it wrong, and you're very susceptible to Satan. So watch out for that. Okay, so how does he deal with this? Listen, 14, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your, we, that we are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. What? <laughs> Anyone else saw read that and go, oh, what? Okay, well, slow down here for a second, because I know when we read it two weeks ago, we went past that, and I'm sure I could, I could see question marks popping out of heads in the room. So you will just slow down. Just as you also partially didn't understand us. Well, it's a connection to understanding what he said prior, but he's saying in this particular case, you understood us. You understood me. You understood myself and Titus and some of the guys that were with me. Because remember, Paul's saying, uh, I want you to go back and remember when I was with you a year or two ago. I was with you for 18 long months, 18 months. You got a good look into who I am. You understood us. Not, not just comprehended what we said, but you understood us. That's a, that's a statement of saying you understood our motivation. How can I live you for 18 months, he's implying, and you not come to some understanding about our motives? So you also partially did understand us. And then he says a kind of a crazy thing that idiomatically in Greek doesn't translate well, but we'll just do it. We are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours, our reason to be proud in the day of the Lord Jesus. You are our reason to be proud. You are our reason to be proud. So what's he talking about right there in the day of the Lord Jesus? motivations that are motivational criticisms that are coming against Paul are always going to center on a suspicion that Paul is acting motivated for his own self-interest. Paul's in this to take money from you. He's in this to manipulate for his gain, for his good, who he is, right? They're always going to be selfish slams against Paul. And what Paul's saying right here is, you know what? You're our reason to be proud, not for me. And that is, as I see you grow in the Lord, as I see you founded in what you believe, as I see you grow into Jesus, when I, as I see godliness sprouting in your life, as I see that fruit that the Holy Spirit brings in your life, I stand back and I go, ah, oh, yes. I am happiest, I am proudest, I want to rejoice the most when I see good happen in your life. And you've understood that about me when I was with you for 18 months. And the same is true for me. You all there in Corinth, you rejoice and are proud and run around and say, woohoo, you know, Paul's out of jail or Paul's okay, you know. You, it turns out that we are not proud in ourselves. We are rejoicing and proud about what God's doing in each other. That's a total non-selfish orientation. That's the motivational hit. Paul's doing this for himself and Paul's saying, no, when I'm proud, when I rejoice, when I proclaim great stuff going on, it's not about me. It's about what God's doing in you. And you're the same with me. Remember that? Remember how we rejoiced over each other for those 18 months we were together? Remember the victories we went through? Remember the struggles we went through together? And when God brought us through those things, we rejoiced for one another? That's the subtext of all he's saying right here. You understood our hearts. We rejoice, we're proud. In fact, right here, this word proud, um, it, it, it's, it's translated three other ways all through the New Testament. Sometimes boast, sometimes glory, sometimes rejoice. So he's basically saying that if, if I'm going to, you know, like if I leave Corinth and I go to another town and I boast what goes on there, I don't boast something selfish in my motivations. I don't say, ah, oh, those stupid Corinthians. I went in there and gave them all this stuff and they believed it. Now they're sending me all this silver and gold every month. What a bunch of idiots. <laughs> now that's, that's bragging and rejoicing about your own selfish motivation, right? I'm on top of them. They're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> But what Paul's saying is the opposite. When I boast, when I rejoice, when I glory, I talk about, let me tell you about the Corinthian church and what God's doing to them and the life that he's bringing out of darkness. Paul's saying, that's my motivations. That's what drives me to see good come into your life. And so I rejoice about what God's doing with you. I don't rejoice that I've hoodwinked you, 
See, that's what he's trying to say. He scrolls this down into a tiny little sentence right here. So his motivations are purely for their good. I rejoice in your good. I rejoice in you. You're why I'm proud, not because of myself. And then he says, in the day of our Lord Jesus. Now, what is that? Sunday? Eh. No. In the day of our Lord Jesus. Well, that's, uh, that's an idiom that means judgment at the end of all time. The day of the Lord, uh, you read it all through the Old Testament, you'll see it come up. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's a day of reckoning. It's when all the accounts get settled out and all the injustices are recognized and made clear and judged. Um, what he's saying is that at the end of all time, uh, in judgment, God's going to look at what I've done in your midst. I, I'm going to be judged for that. And you are going to be judged in terms of how you dealt with me. We're going to be judged about all that kind of stuff. But he says, what I'm saying is that when we stand up the weekend with clear conscience and say, we delighted and rejoiced God in what you did in their life. And I was part of that. I can stand before God and say, it was a delight for me to pour myself out for you, the church at Corinth. So I, I have no conscience problems in front of God. He's going to see all that stuff. So really, it's, it's the coup de grace in terms of motivation. Uh, Paul's saying, you know, th these other guys, they may cast aspersions about my motivations, but I'm telling you my heart's clear, and I'm telling you, at the day of the Lord, I'm going to be able to stand there and say, I'm good. God sees the motives, right? God sees the heart, and we see that all the way through the Old and New Testament. God sees the heart. That's the motivations. And Paul says, at the day of judgment, that's what's going to be seen, and I'm good, and you guys are too. So let's get off all this stupid innuendo about selfish motivations from these guys. You know I was with you for 18 months. You know. You know. Let's go to this last argument. Because <laughs> this one to me is quite fascinating, what he does. This guy says, he broke his promise to visit you. You can't trust a word he says. Has anyone ever used it against you? Yeah, I get it all the time. Here's the deal. See, it's a, it's a very effective argument. You know, eh, so either, you know, forget an appointment or you don't call when you say you're going to or, you know, you have bad follow through. There's lots of reasons why we do what we do. But again, Satan will come alongside and say, you know what? If they don't follow through on those promises, they're not good for anything else they've ever promised in their life. In fact, the trustworthiness of them is completely out the window because they didn't call me at 10 o'clock like they said they were going to. I don't trust a word they're ever going to say to me again. Too harsh? No, not really. <laughs> we tend to do this all the time. So, so what he's saying is that if I, can, if I can come up with a really good factual piece of information that'll prove that Paul is untrustworthy, then everything he says about the gospel will be untrustworthy. Yes. And didn't he promise to come see you in Corinth on this third missionary journey? Has he been there yet? No. And he hasn't. But here, here's the map. Here's the map. Um, oh, I don't have the map yet. Hold on. In, uh, the, the map will explain this. In this confidence, Paul says, I intended at first to come to you. I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and buy you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Okay? So here's the map. This is what I'm trying to explain. This is the third missionary journey that he's on. He's writing the letter <coughs> Uh, right now, while he's on the road. He left Antioch there in present-day Lebanon and went to Ephesus. And what he's implying and what most everyone thinks is that when he got to Ephesus right here, just across the Aegean Sea from Corinth, uh, he may have led them to believe that at that point he was going to come directly across the water, right? And to go over to Corinth first by water from there and then start there and then work up to the rest of his trip. He needs to go up to Macedonia. So there he goes up to Macedonia, boom, up to Macedonia. And then once he finishes all his work way up in Macedonia, then turn around, retrace his steps, and come back to Corinth, visit number two. And then after those two visits, move his way on back to Jerusalem. Now that, that might have been their expectation, and that might have been what the critics were saying. Didn't he say he was going to come to you? He was going to come to you first. He was going to give you two visits in this trip before he went home, and you haven't seen him once. You can't trust a word that slob says, including the gospel. Ooh. Well, what happened instead, just to clear up the history, at Ephesus, he goes north by land, makes up to Macedonia, probably to Philippi up there, writes the second letter to Corinth and sends it down 
to Corinth. And that's the one they're reading right now. The one where the critics are saying, where's Paul? Didn't he say he was coming to come? Where, do you, where is he? Hello? Hello? He's probably not coming. He doesn't love you. You can't trust a word he says. He promised to be here. He's not here. Has he? Anyone? Seen him? No? See? But he does. After the letter's received, sometime later he comes down to Corinth. And, uh, and then they have a face-to-face on the whole issue. But while he's up in Macedonia, he's dealing with these criticisms from his detractors down in Corinth saying, you can't trust Paul. He promised. He broke his promise. You can't trust anything he said. Now, how do you defend against that? Because it's, it's probably true. You know, if you throw, if you throw misfacts, those are called falsehoods. If you throw those around and, and you want to interpret those as someone's unwillingness to do something, you know, it's hard to fight the fact because the fact probably is, is that was Paul's intentions. We have other places written that says that probably was his intention. So how do you fight that? I know how I'd fight it. I, I'd start making excuses, Right? Well, yeah, it was my intention to come across, because I really love you guys. I want to see you first, and you're really, really important to me, much more important than Macedonian people, you know, and all those people over in Ephesus, and you're really, really important. But, you know, uh, I lost my map. No, uh, I forgot. Or something, you know, you come up with something to kind of come up with an excuse to say, you know, don't take it wrong, but I did sort of screw up, so I'm sorry, and I really still love you. And it would sound kind of whiny, Right? kind of whiny, and I'm sorry. And, and it might be true. I mean, you can give them real excuses. Uh, we, had, we, we had lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. oh, my, right? So you can come up with something to kind of get them to forgive you. But you know what? Paul just does not do that. I, what he does, to me, fascinates me. Uh, this, is, this is an extraordinary thing. Here's what he says, verse 17. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or, or what, what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh so that with me there will be a yes, yes, and a no, no at the same time? Oh, but God, as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Again, Greek idioms kind of get in your way. But the easy way to look at it is this. He says, you know, what I purpose, that, that is my intentions, uh, I, my intentions weren't based on the flesh. That is, it wasn't though I said, yeah, I made a promise to visit you, but my flesh said, I really want to go up to Troas because, man, there's a great restaurant up there, you know, and so we'll get to those guys. That's, that's purposing in the flesh, telling one thing to one person and then doing what you want to do instead. So Paul's saying that's purposing in the flesh. So he says, what I purpose, what I d- intend to do, do I do it because of my own fleshly desires? Because of this great hot little Mediterranean restaurant on the beach in Troas? What I do, what I purpose, I don't purpose according to the flesh, he says. And and he says, because if that was true, then what you'd think of me is that I'm the guy who says, yes, 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 yes. But I really mean, no, 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 no. Am I really the guy who says yes in public, but says no in private for selfish reasons? That's why he says there, you know, with me, there will be yes, yes, and no, no. At the very same time, you can't trust a word I say. I make a promise, yes, but I really intend no. Am I that kind of a person? No, I'm not that kind of person. But in 18, he says, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. That is, as God allows, as God does what he's going to do in moving me in this third missionary journey, you know, he does what he's going to do. It's not yes and no. In that way, what he's trying to say is our intention is one thing, but what God designs is usually something very different. If God allows what my intention is, great. But it's not as though I promise one thing because I really want to do something else. I can get you off my back if I say yes, and then I can go on to Troas and have fun. No, that's not it at all, he says. In fact, he says, <clears throat> he's, he's, he's reciting something that had been made famous through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, in chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Jesus speaking, says, again, you, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black. But, verse 37, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, anything beyond these is of evil. 
So he's saying even, even when you make an agreement or a promise to do something, don't say, you know, by the hair on my very head, I promise, or by the city of Jerusalem, I mean, you don't have any control. Just simply say yes and make that a yes or no. Make it a no. So it's very simple. It's very simple. So Paul is basically saying this to them. I'm a yes and a no kind of guy. The Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. Now, now this is a fascinating turn. What he's saying is, when you come to Jesus, in him it's always yes. It's always yes. And let me just read this again. This is fascinating. The Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. Now, why does he say this? Why does he say, in a sense, that Jesus is trustable? Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about Jesus being trustable. Well, because the fundamental satanic attack on Paul's motivations is to say, if you can't trust Paul because he missed his appointment here, you can't trust the promises of God he's talking about. See? That's the real damage. That's really what Satan's trying to get at. If you can't trust Paul, you can't trust the promises he says we have from God. It's totally untrustworthy. And so Paul decides to just turn this around and say, listen, I'm a yes and no kind of guy. I say yes, yes, I'm no, no, according to God's faithfulness and what I want to do. But you know what? When you have promises from God, they're always yes in Jesus. They're always yes in Jesus. He's kind of decoupling his reputation from Jesus' reputation. They kind of get at what Satan would like to do in terms of, you know, dinging on this trust. He's separating those. He says, you know, in a way, I, I don't really care what you think about me. My conscience is clear. I wanted to come to you, but I was prevented. That's not a big deal. But I want you to keep in mind a much more important fact. When God makes promises to you in Jesus, they're yes. They're always yes. They're promises that are fulfilled. And this is an important distinction, important distinction. There's many times that you may hear me or other people who are prominent say, you know, I, I really don't want you to trust me. I'm a, I'm a fallen man. I, I still struggle with some sin, and, and by God's grace, he deals with those in my life. Many times I'll fail, but I want you to understand that that has nothing to do with God's faithfulness to us. See how those are decoupled? Now, if I wanted you to follow me and start a new religion, it would make a big deal how I conduct myself and what I say. <laughs> I'd have to be, you know, perfect and like a prophet or something. I'd have to be something that would be, that you could say, I'm following him because he seems to be almost perfect, proof positive that somehow he's connected to God. No, that actually is a sign of a false religion. What we say is you and I, we all together struggle in this messy place that's full of sin. And by God's grace, he comes and meets my needs. By grace, he comes and meets your needs. I have no special edge over you or you over me. But that's not the issue, how we fail and how we struggle on a day-by-day -day basis. What is important is that God's promises are always fulfilled. They're always yes. So when God says, this is what I promised to you, you can go to the bank and say, God said yes, it's going to be yes. He said yes, it will be yes. He's yes, yes, is what God is. And that's what, that's what Paul's trying to steer away from this criticism. He's not so much trying to defend himself. He's trying to say, I want you to realize that God is faithful. God is a yes, God. Even if I missed my trip to Corinth. See? He's kind of transferring their trust away from him and onto God. He, he goes on with this. He says, for as many, are, as many as are the promises of God in him... They are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. As many as are the promises of God in him, Jesus, they're yes. God makes promises to us, to mankind. Right? Starting all the way back to Abraham, maybe even back to Adam, in fact. Promises, but especially to Abraham about, about life, and being able to live with him and under his protection and care. These promises have gone on through all the ages and come to us in Jesus. Remember it said, uh, it, it, God said to Abraham, in your seed all, all nations will be blessed. That seed, Paul tells us, is Jesus. So interestingly enough, he's saying, 
that starting with you, this promise will end up realizing itself in Jesus, who will bring life to billions, to billions. God's promise of life is yes in Jesus. All the promises of what God wants for us. Remember we talked last week about the sovereignty of grace, the sovereignty of God's desire to give to you and to bless you and to bring life to you. Are they empty promises? No, they're yes in Jesus. That's what he's saying. They're yes in Jesus. So if God has promised you life now, here, and in eternity, and past the point of judgment, is he trustworthy? In Jesus, the answer is yes. That's what he's saying. So Paul says, so I missed my appointment with you in Corinth. I wanted to come your way. But God is faithful. I operate based on what God does. But I don't want you to miss the fact that because I missed my appointment with you in Corinth, that you think God is untrustable because that's not true. In Jesus, all his promises are yes. You can take it to the bank. It doesn't matter if I miss my trip to Corinth or not. Wholly different with him. And then he says a funny thing. Therefore, also through him, talking about Jesus, is our amen to the glory of God through us. What? <laughs> okay, the word amen. You know what amen means? So be it. So be it. Or like I, the vernacular I put it in is uh, what he said. That's what amen means. What he said. So it basically is to say, I'm in agreement with what's going down. I go, oh, that's good. Amen. I'm with that. I'm on board. I agree with that 100%. Let it be. So be it. There you go. So he's saying, you know, God's promises in Jesus are always yes. So through Jesus is our, so be it. Amen. I'm with it. To God's glory. glory. And not to my glory. So, So Paul's saying there is a sovereign plan that's coming from God's direction in terms of your life. A sovereign plan based on promises that he's made. And by the way, we did this a while ago. There's a quick quiz. The connection, the religious word that's a connection between where we are now and the fulfilled promises of God is a thing called, it's a bridge called faith. It's a bridge called faith. It's taking God at his word right now based on the content and character of the one who always says yes to his promises. And I, by faith, say God is going to be faithful to say yes to that promise. I haven't got it yet, I haven't got it yet, I haven't got it yet, but now I do. That's what faith is. It's only just is taking God at his word. And when God says this, I go, amen, so be it. By faith, God, I know your character. I know the resources of heaven that you have on my behalf. I know your love for me. I am persuaded to say it's going to happen. That's faith. Just like, just like if uh, you know, a friend of yours makes a promise. And this friend of yours has always kept their promises every single time. And they make another promise to you, which seems absolutely outrageous. And another friend comes to you and says, what makes you think they're ever going to, they're, they're going to come clean on their promise? What makes you think they're ever going to do it? Then fulfill it. And your answer is? Because every time in the past they have. Faith built on the character of the one who makes the promise. That's, that's all faith is. So that's what he's saying. Amen to the glory of God through us in all these things. Finally, he says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. See how this doesn't flow well? Okay, we'll slow down. Here we go. He who establishes us. Established means the one who set your feet on the ground, got you settled, started you out from where you started on your walk with the Lord. The one who did that is Paul. It's God. So don't think just because I was with you a couple years ago for 18 months that I'm responsible for establishing you because the one who established you in this faith, this belief that God in his love will promise, his promises will come true, yes. That that wasn't me. God's the one who did that in your life. And by the way, God's the one who did that in my life as well. See how he says that? He who established us with you in Christ and anointed us as God. God's the one that got me established, got my feet on the ground. From this footing, by faith, I look forward to his promises fulfilled in my life. And God's the one who settled your feet on the ground, got you established, and then launched you by faith on the fulfillment of his promises in Christ. Because remember, in Jesus, in Christ, it's always yes, the promises happen. So again, he's really, he's pushing their trust off of him, off his reputation, 
and under the reputation of God. God's the one that started you on the path. God's the one that started me on the path. Hey, I was on the road to Damascus and pow, you know, he's the one that started me. He's the one that establishes us, both of us together. Not some super televangelist who walks around the Aegean Sea, God himself in Christ. And he says that he anointed us. Another religious word. Anointed means... Anyone use that word in common language this week? See, anointed. Anointed is the picture of the prophet Samuel coming to the boy David in his father's house to anoint him king by putting oil on his head, which was a richness, and then putting his hand on him and anointing him king. Basically saying to this young boy, David, at this point, right now, you are a king. But I guess you're not quite yet, but you really are. And it would be years before David actually would take the kingship. But he's been anointed, which means a promise has been made. A personal promise to you has been made. And in Jesus, all his promises are yes. So that's what the anointing is. In some, in some real sense, he says, God is the one who anointed us. He, he put his hand on us and said, you're mine. I know who you are. I love you. And your status with me as my child is fixed right now. And the fullness of the promises about you being in my family are still yet to come, but a lot of them are right now. You can take those to the bank because in Jesus, they're yes. God's the one who anointed us. So again, Paul's saying that wasn't me. Did I ever come to you and pour oil on your head and say, oh, no, you're our God's child? No, God did that. God's the one who called you to himself, not me. And then, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Sealed? Anyone you sealed this week? Closer. <laughs> the only thing I seal are Ziploc bags. I realized as I was thinking through the grammar here, seal, 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 seal. Oh, you seal envelopes. Oh, I didn't write any letters this week, so... But sealing for us means to close something up that was open, right? Well, it's close. Uh, you got to think more like this picture right here. You know, when they used to write letters, uh, you'd close the letter, and uh, they usually didn't have glue on the letters. That's very modern. Uh, but they would close the letters, and they would seal them. They'd close them up by putting a wax seal on it, right? Drip a little wax on there. That would keep it closed. And, oh, not only just drip a little wax in there, but what do you do to the wax while it's still wet? You put your mark on it, which says, I wrote this, and the person who can open this is only the person who's qualified by my mark to open it. I've sealed this, which means that I have control of who gets to open it as well. That's why in the crucifixion of Jesus, when they put the stone up against the tomb, the authorities came and they sealed the tomb. They put a little wax on there put probably the signet ring of the procurator at the area, impressed on it, so that anyone who'd come up to that stone who'd want to open that tomb would see that weird-looking little thing right there and look on the indentation on it and say, oh, this has the seal of someone in great authority. I'm not authorized to open this or else they'll come get me. So a seal is a way to close something up and to finalize the authority of who closed it. That's what you have to think of when you seal. So it says who also sealed us. You mean he closed us up with a glop of wax? No, he put his mark on us. And he said, this one's mine. And no one has the power to undo my mark on them. No one has a greater authority. They're going to have to deal with me. I put my mark on them. Did you realize you have a red wax seal on your head that's got the mark of God in it? In a sense, metaphorically, I'm being silly, but that's kind of what it is. When Satan comes around town and wants to take you down, in a real way, he looks at that seal on you and says, well, this one's marked. <laughs> this one this one's belong, belongs to the big guy. Uh, and he actually, we know, he actually has to go in the presence of God and ask permission to do whatever he wants to do with us. Why? Because you're marked. God says, that one's mine. You don't mess with them without coming to me first. So it's a, way of, it's a way of, through authority, saying that there's protection and ownership and you're going to have to deal with someone bigger. See, that's so God's the one who sealed us and it says that he gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. His spirit in our hearts as a pledge. 
pledge is not just a furniture wax. Let's, let's work on pledge for a second. In Ephesians 1, Paul says, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, that's back again, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. This word pledge, it's, a, it's, exactly, it's exactly the English word that means to make a down payment. Exactly. So if uh, back in the first century, if you hired someone to work in your fields, uh, they would come in early in the day, uh, you'd say, okay, here's my contract with you. I'll give you, you know, so many coins by the end of the day. And just to show you that I'm not messing with you, here's my down payment at the beginning of the day. That's the pledge, the first payment in that. It's also the word, if you have an authorized, if you have a King James Version, this word is oftentimes translated earnest. And if you ever do real estate transactions, the beginning of a financial transaction, you put down earnest money. It's exactly what it is. It's the same thing. So what he's saying right here is that he's given us the spirit in our hearts as a first payment, as the beginning of so much more to come. He's serious. He's serious about the fact that he's imprinted you with his name. You are his now, and he's so serious about it and wants to reinforce it that he's giving you a down payment just so you'll say, hey, this guy's really serious. And that down payment is the Holy Spirit. Wow. The ability through his spirit to directly relate to God, your father, through the spirit. And, and uh, it's great. You come to understand the richness of God. We talked last week about drawing near to God. How do you draw near? Well, his spirit in us allows us to relate and draw near. And he's saying, if you think that's great, that's just the pledge. And you read further in scripture and find out there is a day coming where we'll know him as he is. We'll know the fullness of who he is. And, and, and the, you know, it says in Jeremiah 31, that day is going to come and none of us are going to be walking around saying, no God, no God, no God. Why? Because they'll all know him, right? And not just the, the little bit we have through the Holy Spirit right now. It's a pledge. It's a down payment, a great and very rich down payment. So these are the promises. He who established us with you in Christ and put his seal on you, anointed us, also sealed us, gave us the spirit as a pledge. This is Paul's way of reaffirming the fact that you can put your trust in this God. He, he's, gone, he's gone to large measures to try and reassure you the fact that when he put his stamp on you, you're his and it's not threatened. I, Paul, on the other hand, don't follow me. Many times I mess up on my appointments to come to Corinth, but with God. He's put his seal upon you. He's put his mark on you. He's given you a down payment with his Holy Spirit, right? He's done all these things just to reassure your heart that he's good for his promises, because he is. Because the promises of God in Jesus are always yes. Isn't that, see it? That's what he's trying to say. You can take him to the bank. His promises are good. Whew. It's God's promises, not Paul's. It's an issue. Okay, let's wrap this up. So you got these guys who are saying nasty things about Paul. All for the satanic purpose of torpedoing the power of Paul's message. Uh, ad hominem attacks. Attack the man. Don't attack the message. And maybe we can take the message down in the process. So how does Paul deal with it? This is just a summary. By exemplary conduct. He says, listen, I don't do anything I haven't done in your presence. You've seen me. I'm the guy you think I am. I'm that. And by the way, it is a serious problem when we as believers try and communicate truth, but then live lives of reprobates. Conduct matters. It really does. It really does. But Paul's saying in this particular case, mine's always been great, so get off my back. You've seen it. I've been in the 18 months. The second thing he says is, uh, I summarize it kind of as an exhaustive communication. I, there's nothing I did not write you, he said. You're reading what I wrote. You got the whole thing. You got the whole purpose of God. You got everything. I've told you everything. And with us, it's important that when we share the gospel with other people, we, we tell them everything. You know one of the things that largely is left out of the gospel presentation when we share about becoming a believer? Well, many times sin starts there. Sin's usually there, but it's sort of soft-pedaled. The one I'm thinking of is uh, the cost of following. The cost of discipleship. Yeah. Those who want to follow me, pick up your cross and let's go. The cost of discipleship. Now, we don't normally talk about that because 
Well, that's just kind of a negative side of the whole message. <laughs> By the way, if you become a believer, life will be wonderful, and you may lose everything you own and be in pain the rest of your life. Yes. <laughs> Who does that? Now, that's not, you know, I'm being facetious. That's not always exactly how it goes. But that, that could very well be it. There's a, there's a, a significant statement in all the scriptures that if you want Jesus... You have to let the rest go. And, I, and it's not going to be roses. There are no promises to be roses. But there are promises to walk alongside you in the process. And that's the greatness of life with God, to walk with him in these things. So anyway, exhaustive communication. Fill everyone on everything. Don't, don't, you, you don't want to, See, he said, I, your blood's not on my hands or on my head because I told you everything. And then one of the last things I want to do is have someone become a believer and say, well, you didn't tell me it was going to be like this. You need to. And the whole story. Because it's in the whole story that the glory comes. It's incredible. Third, he says, my motives are transparent. You, I lived with you for 18 months. You saw my heart. You, you started to understand who, who I am, where I'm coming from. You know, I don't glory in myself or rejoice in myself. I rejoice when I see great things happening in your life. Remember? Remember how we did that together? Yeah, okay. So let me, you know, there's, this is really a call for us as well to be relatively transparent in our motives to each other. If people can't discern them based on what you do, the best thing to do is just tell them. Okay? Just tell them. I, I had a, a, a little thing this week. I had an interaction with someone, and, uh, and I realized after the interaction, I seemed kind of gruff. I, I, but I didn't explain myself at the time. So I went back to him later and said, you know what? I just want to make sure you understand why I just did what I did. And I explained it. And I said, well, you know, I, I never really thought bad of you for what you did but I'm glad you explained it because now it makes a lot more sense. And you know what that does? Closes up a hole for Satan to get in there and say, you know why he did that? So live your, live your motives transparently. It's just an incredible thing. Explain them sometimes. That would help some of us, okay? And then finally, he says, he transferred their trust from him to God. I think that's one of the most fascinating things in this entire ad hominem attack. Sure, attack me because my calendar was kind of flawed. I didn't get to Corinth, but you know what? You can take God's promises to the bank. Because God's promises in Jesus are always yes. I think that's fascinating. Takes you completely out of the picture. He wants them to build their relationship with God, not their relationship with him. He wants their salvation to be based on what God's done on their behalf, not what Paul has done on behalf. That's just extremely important and transferred their trust to God and gotten out of that. Paul does not sit and whine and make excuses for missing that appointment. He says... There is an appointment at the end of the age, and God has good for you there. In Jesus, it's yes. He won't miss it. Although I'd love to come to Corinth. So, okay, we're at the end. These possible things, I need to put a caveat on these four arguments. We're pretty sure that that's what was going on there because the counterarguments make sense. And like I say, when we get to chapter 8, he'll hit on these big time later on. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He'll talk more about them. But one last, one last caveat. When there are ad hominem attacks being made against you and you find out about them, usually the worst thing you can do is try and defend yourself. Just say straight up what's going on. Well, this is what happened. This is what happened. I don't care if you think of what my motives are, but I am who I am. But I want you to understand my message is God's message. And it's not, it's not dependent on my conduct. God's message is true. Attack me if you want, but hey, I'm just the messenger. But I want you to understand the message, is what Paul's saying right here. I want you to understand the message. Paul doesn't do anything to try and redeem his reputation. He speaks a few straight things and says, trust God. It's a very healthy way to deal with ad hominem attacks. Really healthy. Okay. Go to chapter 2 next week, and we'll see where he goes after this. All right, let's pray. Lord, I guess what resounds in my mind over and over again is his, his powerful statement that, uh, that your promises in Jesus are always yes. There is no changeability. There is no unfaithfulness in your ability to carry through your promises to us. They're always yes. And Lord, uh, we do fail one another here from time to time, not intentionally. But Lord, I pray that in the midst of that and the humility where you put us, that you would be glorified, that you would be shown faithful, that your promises would be shown to be trustworthy. 
God, we thank you that you've come to us and brought us to yourself. We thank you that you yourself, you yourself have established us in Christ. You set our feet in him. And we attribute that to no effort of any man. We attribute it to you yourself. So Lord, continue to take us on in this walk with you. Uh, pre- uh, keep us from ad hominem attacks against each other. May our ears be closed to Satan's attempts to divide us through those, through misperceptions of motives or conduct. But Lord, in all things, may your message be true, that your promises to us in Jesus are yes, yes. So thank you for your faithfulness to us. We love you so much. Thank you for this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.